Okay, guys, so I'm going to pick up where we left off last time. Um, I'm going to actually reread the couple chapters that we read the last day that we were in school. Um, and then we will finish this section. So we're going to be reading chapters 27 to 30. Um, and if you remember, we kind of picked up um, Misha and Janina had gone out and were um, stealing food. And we talked a little bit about how Janina kind of became the less mature person and Misha was suddenly becoming the more mature person um, and talked a little bit about why that might be. So here we go, chapter 27. The next day I visited the boys. I knew I would find them in their new place, an alley behind the fire gutted butcher shop. Before I got there, I could hear them, a whacking sound followed by cheers and again whack, then cheers. What was happening? I turned the corner. Big Henrik was holding Kuba upside down by his ankles, while Ferdy walloped Kuba's rump with a big bone, one of the many that were lying around. Ferdy stopped when he saw me. Misha, come on, knock out your lice. Then I saw. Each time Ferdy walloped Kuba, a tiny blizzard, like salt, fell from Kuba's hair to the ground. With every blow, Kuba swung back and forth like the pendulum of a grandfather clock. When it was over, over Kuba took the bone from Ferdy. He said, your turn, Misha. Just because he made me think of it, my head was itching more than ever. I could feel them crawling. I got down on all fours in front of Big Henrik. In a moment, I was hanging upside down, staring at his knees. Get ready, said Kuba, and then I heard Ferdy's voice, wait, the book. Ferdy stuffed a book down my pants, and the world shook as Kuba gave me the first wallop. Another voice came screaming, stop it, stop it. I twisted my head as best I could and saw Janina attacking Kuba, kicking him, punching him. Ferdy grabbed her, held her flailing. I'm not hurting him, said Kuba. Who is this, said Enos. This is Janina, I said, as Kuba swung the bone. Then between wallops, my, si, stir. By the time Kuba was done with me, Janina was yapping, me, me. She was heading for Big Henrik when Enos said, you can't have a little girl in a dress hanging upside down. She needs pants. I was the littlest, so I was elected. I took off my pants and gave them to Janina. I stuffed in the book, and upside down she went, and Kuba started walloping away. With each spank, she gave a yelp and a laugh. I had a thought. Maybe her angel will come out. This was my latest information from the boys on angels. Every person carries his or, own, his or her own angel inside. When the rest of you is killed, the angel comes out and flies off to heaven. When I asked where heaven is, everyone had a different answer. Kuba said Russia. Oleg said Washington, America. Eno said, you're all stupid. It's right here, Warsaw, on the other side of the wall. As I watched Janina's little body jump with every spank, I couldn't imagine the angel inside her putting up such a disturbance. I stared and stared, but nothing came out of her but yelps and laughs and lice. Kuba finally stopped. Janina was begging for more. She wouldn't give up my pants. Everyone laughed as I chased her around the rubble, the book bouncing in the pants like a load of horse flop. Suddenly, the laughter stopped. I turned around, and four people were standing at the corner of the charred butcher shop. Everyone, even Janina, stopped and stared at them. They were two couples. The men were jackboots. Their buttons glinted like morning stars on their uniforms. The ladies were blonde-haired and wore little white hats and white gloves. All four of them were smiling. One of the jackboots was holding something. It was black. I was pretty sure it was a gun or a weapon. I wondered, why aren't we running? And then I saw movement. Janina was walking toward them. I called out, Janina, no! Still smiling, the jackboot raised the weapon. He held it up to his eye, aiming it at her. No! I charged into the jackboot. He didn't budge. He reached down with his free hand and tossed me aside. He aimed again through the weapon at Janina. I heard. Click. Enos called, Misha, stop! It's a camera. It's taking pictures. I didn't know what he was talking about, but I backed off. The man with the camera aimed and clicked again. Beside me, Janina was doing a dance in the dust and smiling at the cameraman and saying, do it again, again. The couples were no longer just smiling. They were laughing out loud. The ladies were clinging to their men's arms to keep from falling over with laughter. Then one of the ladies pinched her nose and the other pinched her nose and they laughed louder and the cameraman took more pictures. And the more they laughed and took pictures, the faster Janina danced and danced. The dust she kicked up fell on their shoes. When the laughing died down, Janina stepped forward. She walked up to one of the ladies and said, Do you live on the other side? The lady did not answer. She just looked down and smiled. Then Janina reached out and touched the skirt of the lady's black and white checkered dress. 
The lady's smile vanished. She stepped back from Janina's reach. She looked down at the dust on her white shoes. She said something to the others. The smiles came back. The men taking the pictures gave the camera to his lady. He motioned to Janina and me to stand side by side. He stood beside us. I could feel him smiling. He was close, but he never touched us. He said something to the lady. She aimed and clicked. Maybe they'll shoot us now, I thought. But they didn't. They merely went away. As they were leaving, I called, aren't you going to shoot us? They didn't respond. Enos hurried over. Stupid gypsy. He smacked the back of my head. Learn to shut your stupid mouth. I wished Yuri were there. I prefer that he do the smacking. Who were they, said Ferdy. Soldiers with their girlfriends, said Enos. Out for a stroll in the ghetto. It's Sunday. What's Sunday, I said. Enos sneered. The day they don't shoot you. Back on the streets, we saw other soldiers and girlfriends strolling about. The jackboot ladies wore white gloves. I couldn't stop staring at the gloves. They were whiter than snow. Summer was flies. I thought of them as little birds. I remembered little birds. I remembered them singing as I lay in tall grass that smelled like carrots. Except for crows, birds did not come to the ghetto. There was no bread for them to eat, no seed. The crows that came did not sing. They squawked at each other. They seemed to say, over here, I found one, or stay away, this is mine. There were always plenty for them to eat. They ate people, crows and flies. The wagons came in the morning. There had been a few horses left pulling the morning ho wagons, but the jab boots took them, so now men became horses. When the wagon came to a body, it stopped, and the men went to the body. Not all bodies were dead. If a body had flies but no crow, it might still be alive, especially if it had no newspaper over it. Sometimes, crows pecked away at the newspaper. When the men came to a body, the crows usually walked away. They walked five or six steps and turned and squawked at the men. One man took hands, one took feet, and they flopped the body onto the wagon. When the body flopped onto the pile, the whole wagon load of flies jumped into the air like lice from a walloper. Then they settled back down again, and a crow or two landed and went along for the ride. I used to think that if a body had no shoes or socks or coat, it was dead. But then I saw one such body climb out from under the pile on a wagon and walk away. The men had made a mistake. But you could count on crows. They never made a mistake. Some people died from sickness, some from hunger. There wasn't much I could do about the sickness, but the hunger, that was where I came in. Feeding my family, and as much as possible Dr. Korzak's orphans, was what the world had made for me. All the parts, the stealing, the speed, the size, the rash stupidity, came together to make me the perfect smuggler. Janino followed me everywhere, my shadow. I went through the wall at night, and there she was behind me with a sack of her own. I never spoke to her. I pretended she wasn't there. We raided the Blue Camel Hotel. We raided the finest homes in Warsaw. We had many favorite kitchens. One was a special favorite because we always found pickled herring there. We must have felt very comfortable in that kitchen because we always turned the light on. One night we were sampling the herring when I heard Janina say, hello. I turned around. A little boy was standing in the doorway. He wore pajamas. He was squinting in the light. The boy mumbled, who are you? I am Janina, she said. She suddenly seemed very grown up. She pointed to me. This is Misha. The boy kneaded his fists in his eyes. Are you Jews? Janina laughed. Ha, Jews? No, we would never be Jews. Not us. Ha. She held out a piece of herring. Want some fish? The boy took the fish. And for the next hour, the three of us sat around the kitchen table eating pickled herring and crackers and sugar cookies and milk. Drinking the milk, I thought about Dr. Korzak and the cow. We told the little boy we were playing a game called Whisper, so he wouldn't talk or laugh too loud. We went to the window with our sacks full. The boy wanted to come with us. He cried. We told him we would come back to visit him again, but I knew we could never return to that house. At first, Janina's father did not know when she went smuggling with me. He was always sleeping when we slipped quietly out of the room. I think Uncle Shepsel was often awake, but he never said anything. Then came the night. We returned, sacks full, and found a lineup happening in the courtyard. Jack boots shouting, jack dogs a snarling, blinding lights, filthy pigs of Abraham. We held head our sacks and sneaked behind the last row of people. We crept around until we found the Milgrams. We squeezed in between Uncle Shepsel and Mr. Milgram. I was shocked to see Mrs. Milgram standing in line. Her head drooped on her chest. It was very poor attention. Mr. Milgram's hand came down and squeezed Janina's ear. She squeaked. A nearby jackboot was shouting, you smelly animals, you stink, don't you ever wash? I hoped Buffo wasn't there. This was his chance to get me. 
A man with a bullhorn was up front. We know you are doing it. This is your first and last warning. You will be caught. Yes, yes. And when you are caught, you will be shot if you are lucky. If you are not lucky, we will hang you. Either way, you are dead. One way is slower, more painful. Do you understand? Jawa, I called out, using the Jack Burt boot word for yes. No one else spoke. This time it was my ear that got squeezed. I looked up at Mr. Mr. Milgram. What is he talking about? He whispered, you smugglers, you must stop now. I did not stop. But I tried to make Judina stop. The next time she followed me into the night, I stopped in the courtyard and told her to go back. No, she said. Your father wants you to stop, I told her. He'll be mad if they shoot you. No, they'll hang you. No, you get in the way. You're a filthy Jew. So are you. No, I could barely see her face in the darkness. I smacked her. This time, I didn't give her a chance to smack me back. I pushed her to the ground. She came up flailing at me, and I hit her and pushed her again and hit her again. She was crying. I left her there and walked away. She didn't come after me. She started yelling, Misha's going to the wall. Misha smuggles. Misha smuggles. Out in the street, a whistle blew. I ran back to her. I clamped my hand over her mouth. Okay, I said, okay. I yanked her hair. Her yowl echoed in the courtyard. The whistle blew. We ran. We made it to the wall and practically dove through the two-brick hole, but we didn't smuggle food that night. I had the idea that as long as we didn't steal food, she was safe. As we passed houses, she kept pestering, let's go in there, there. To distract her, I led her to the merry-go-round. It was deserted and dark. The people were in bed. A streetlight in the distance caught several horses leaping out of the shadows. There was no music, nothing going around, yet I could have sworn they were moving. I looked at the empty spot. I thought of the beautiful black horse chopped off at the hooves. I thought of the man who turned blue. We went to the far side, away from the light. We each climbed onto a horse. I pretended we were galloping, racing. Janina kept shouting, I win! After a while, she came over to my horse and climbed on behind me. She put her arms around my waist. Her chin jutted into my back. Faster! Faster! When I got tired of this, I said, Do you want to see an angel? What's an angel? She said, I'll show you. We climbed down from the horse and I took her to the cemetery. The moon was going in and out of the clouds. The night sky looked like smoking rubble. It took a while, but I finally found it. It towered above us. The wings blotted out much of the sky. There, I said. She gazed up, her mouth open. Angel? It's not a real one, I told her. It's only one made of stone. It's what real ones would look like if you could see them. Why can't we see them? Because they hide inside people. There's one inside of you. Inside me? I clamped my hand over her mouth. Everybody has an angel hiding inside. When you die, your angel comes out. You can die, but not your angel. Your angel never dies. She looked up at the great wings. It's too big to fit inside me. When it's inside you, it's little, I told her. When it comes out, it grows like a balloon. Her own mouth was never shy about adding detail. My own mouth was never shy about adding details that the boys had overlooked. She felt herself all over. She stuck her fingers in her ears and her nostrils. I don't feel it. She reached up and pulled my mouth open and tried to peer inside. I don't see yours. She stomped her foot. I want to see one. You can't, I told her. But he didn't exactly believe that. I believed that sooner or later, I would catch a glimpse of one coming out of a freshly dead body or just hanging around, reluctant to leave. They don't live here. They live in heaven. Where's that? I don't know, I said. Eno says it's right here on this side of the wall, but I never saw an angel over here. Kuba says it's in Russia. Oluk says Washington, America. What's Washington, America? Eno says a place with no wall and no lice and lots of potatoes. Gina reached out. Janina reached out and touched the stone foot. Then she smacked it. I don't like you, she said. We went home. I hoped we wouldn't walk into a lineup again. We didn't, but there was something else. Creeping along the shadows toward home, I saw an orange glow beyond a corner and heard a strange sound like a fierce gust of wind. We sneaked up to the corner for a peek. I couldn't believe what I saw. A man was spouting fire. The fire came gushing out of a hose, like burning hose, horse water, and down into a sewer hole in the street. Enos, Ferdy, Olek! We ran home. I couldn't sleep. At sunrise, Janina was snoring. I raced to the butcher shop ruins. They were there, all of them. I told them what I saw. And Ferdy blew a smoke ring. Olek said flamethrower. Eno said they're cracking down. Kuba said, you... You sewer rats should come over the wall with me. The sewer stinks. They can't watch all the manholes, said Enos, and the flamethrower only reaches 20 meters. 
It's gorgeous, I said. They all stared at me. I would have stared at myself if I could. I don't know where I got that word, but it was true. When I saw the brilliant orange flame in the night, I saw better than ever how gray was the world I lived in. Last chapter. I could not stop Janina from following me. And we couldn't and we couldn't eat merry-go-round horses and stone angels. So soon we were stealing food again. And then something happened, and I was glad it did. The day was hot and steamy. Steamy. Janina and I were down near the entrance to the cemetery on Gacia Street. We were watching the long parade of body wagons lined up at the gate. The wagons were pulled by men horses. The bodies were in heaps. The number of them was much higher than I could count at the time. A peppery cloud of flies hovered over the flopped arms and legs. The air buzzed. Only a few living people came with the wagons. Except for the rags they wore and the fact that they were standing, they looked just like the bodies. One old woman held on to an ankle jutting out from the heap. A flop at the gate collected money. Only the dead got into the cemetery for free. We heard a commotion. We followed the noise to an intersection of streets. There were jackboots and flops and young boys. One of the flops was Buffo. People were watching. I didn't think they... I think they did not want to watch, but the jackboots were pointing guns at them. There was also, in the middle of the square, a pile of onions. I could smell them. A jackboot was pulling open the jackets of the boys, and the onions were tumbling out. The boys all seemed to have the same problem. They were hunchbacks. Only the humps in their backs were made of onions. When all the humps were emptied out, the jackboot called to the people, We tell you, do not smuggle. We tell you. And the jackboots and flops began beating the boys with their clubs, and the boys' hats flew, and they were screaming and falling and bleeding among the onions, and the people watched and did not move. I pulled Janina away. See, I said. I squeezed her arm. I shook her. See what happens when you steal food? Do you want that to happen to you? She yelled into my face. I hate you. She broke loose and ran off. Good, I thought. She finally learned her lesson. And for the rest of the day, I thought the pest is gone. I wanted to make sure, so I told her father. I told him she had been following me, smuggling with me. I told him I could not make her stop. I could not keep her safe. She stood beside me, gaping. Her father's face turned hard and ugly. I thought he would smack her, but he didn't even touch her. He bent down until his face was right in front of hers, like a jackboot in a lineup. He looked at her as if she were a stranger. He said one word, no. Her lip pouted out and quivered. Her great eyes watered. She ran to the mattress and threw herself onto it and huddled into her mother. When I went out that night, she stayed put. It was getting harder to creep down the stairs in the dark now as people were sleeping there. More and more people were being tucked into the ghetto. People were living in stairwells and bathrooms and cellars and roofs. I felt my way through the sleeping bodies and waited in the shadows of the courtyard. No one came down after me. At every corner along the way, the two brick hole, I stopped and looked back. No one followed. I wriggled through the hole and I thought, I'm free. The next day back inside the wall, I was sitting on a curb in the street. I was watching a little girl on the opposite curb, lunching on the snot pouring from her nose, when I heard a familiar cry, fat man, fat man. I ran. Sure enough, there was Janina in the middle of the street, squatting on her haunches, hurling her voice, thumbing her nose at Buffo, taunting him in perfect imitation of me. I saw the gleam in Buffo's eyes as he came clumping after her, spewing specks of mint, his massive belly bouncing. Janina screamed and laughed and ran. I fell in beside her, and when we turned a corner, I shoved her into an alley, and when Buffo came around, I threw stones at him, and I saw his eyes darting about for her and his fingers curling. I couldn't stand the thought of him pulling her into the death balloon of his belly. I remembered Cuba and the funeral in the cemetery. I turned my back on Buffo and pulled down my pants and gave him a moon. I heard his roar, and I had to run while pulling up my pants. When I finally appeared back in the courtyard, Janina could not stop laughing. I hated her mimicking me in everything I did. All my talents were useless with her. I could not escape her any more than I could outrun my shadow. From that day on, I stopped tormenting Buffo, only to give her one less part of me to copy. That night, I raided two homes on the other side, but only got a few sprouting potatoes and a can of sardines. Once again, Janina had stayed behind. I dropped potato through the open back window of the orphanage and returned to the room, stumbling over sleeping bodies in the stairway. Lying down in the blackness of the room, I reached out to touch Janina. I felt nothing. I groped around. She wasn't there. I sat up. I had a thought, but I couldn't believe it. I sat up until I heard the door squeak open. 
I laid down. I felt her step over me to her place on the floor. I went to sleep. So I want you to be thinking about where could Janina possibly be going? I had put two potatoes and the sardines on the table when I came in that morning. That night, in the morning, there were three potatoes, more, plus a pancake. It went that way night after night, through the wall and to heaven, thanks to Enos, that's what we were calling the other side of the wall, raiding kitchen, cellars, trash cans separately. Like a good little girl, Janina was obeying her father. She did not go with me. She went on her own. Sometimes we passed each other in the shadows. Once, we found ourselves spinning around the revolving door of the Blue Camel Hotel at the same time. We pretended not to see each other. One time, we almost bumped heads reaching into the same garbage can. In the mornings, there on the table would be her loot, our loot. She mixed hers with mine. Every morning, Mr. Milgram thanked me for the food. He never thanked Janina, as he believed she never left the room all night. She never claimed credit. To stop the smugglers, the jackboots sent more patrols and more dogs into the ghetto at night. There were gunshots, screams, the orange glow of flamethrowers, but I wasn't afraid. There was still the darkness, and Buffo seemed to appear only in daylight. One day, we were both very sleepy. It had been harder than usual to find food in heaven the night before, and day was coming by the time we both made it back to the room. We slept for a while and went outside together. We played pickup sticks in the dust of the courtyard, and then went wandering about the streets. I was, as always, on the alert for signs of Buffo or the mystery cow, but in time, the buzzing of the flies and the warmth of the day took the edge from my attention and made me drowsy. I wobbled into an alleyway and laid myself down. Janina, of course, did the same. Within moments, I was sleeping. Next thing I knew, I was jerked awake. Janina was screaming. A barefoot clump of rags was slouching off, the, off down the alley. Janina was reaching for her shoe on the ground. He tried to steal my shoe, he, she whined. I laughed. He thought you were dead. She yelled after the clump, I'm not dead. As she put her shoe back on, she was staring at me. What's that? She was pointing to something. I looked. It was a brown seed with a spray of white fluff coming out of it. It was clinging to my shirt. And suddenly the word for it was on my tongue, a word I didn't even know I knew. Milkweed, I said. She plucked it from my shirt. She held it by the seed up to the light. She dusted her nose with it and giggled. So almost think like the dandelions when you blow and the white things blow away. That's what this looks like. She brushed the fluff across her cheek, closing her eyes. She stood on tiptoes and held it as high as she could and let it go. It sailed toward the sky. That's my angel, she said. Then they were all around us, milkweed puffs flying. I picked one from her hair. I pointed, look, a milkweed plant was growing in a heap of rubble. It was thrilling just to see a plant, a spot of green in the ghetto desert. The bird-shaped pods had burst, and the puffs were spilling out, flying off. I cracked a pod from the stem, the stem and blew into the silk-lined hollow, sending the remaining puffs sailing, a snowy shower rising, vanishing into the clouds. So knowing that the book is called Milkweed, I want you to think about what the title, knowing that it has to do with this plant, what the title might have to do with the events of the story.